Welcome to Nepal Now. My name is Marty Logan. Nearly 200 countries, Nepal included, are scheduled to meet in Scotland in November to discuss how to respond to climate change. One of the items on the agenda will be how much money wealthier countries will commit to transferring to so-called developing countries to adapt to the impacts of climate change and to green their own economies. Notably, rich countries haven't come anywhere close to meeting their $100 billion pledge for 2020, an amount that they promised to provide yearly until 2025. An estimate from Oxfam tallies the dollars delivered in 2017-18 at, at most, $22 billion, as you'll hear in today's episode with Raju Pandit Chetri of Prakriti Resources Centre. The clock is ticking. On February 7th, a glacier collapsed in the Indian Himalaya, sending a devastating torrent of ice, water and mud downstream, where it flattened settlements, plowed through roads and bridges, nearly destroyed two dams and killed at least 26 people. Nearly 200 more are still missing. The exact cause of the event is being probed, but one theory points to a high-altitude lake that burst its banks. This is known as a glacial lake outburst flood, or GLOF. Last September, a report warned that 47 such GLOFs were at risk of occurring in the Himalaya, including 21 in Nepal. Such climate disasters are costly. Each time a GLOF, flood, or landslide happens, it is governments that must rescue and resettle those displaced and rebuild infrastructure spending precious resources that should be invested in health, education, and other key development sectors. Which makes it more important than ever that wealthy countries deliver the resources that they promise. Despite the existential challenge posed by climate change, Raju Pandit Chetri is optimistic that rich and poor countries can cooperate to respond more effectively. If you enjoy this episode, please like, follow, or subscribe to Nepal Now. We'd also appreciate a review on Apple Podcasts. You can email me at marty at martylogan.net and chat with the show on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And now, my conversation with Raju Pandit Chetri. Raju Pandit Chetri, welcome to Nepal Now Podcast. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Marty. Thank you for having me in this uh, program of yours. So last week, uh, CARE, the organization CARE, released a report that got a fair bit of coverage in the media. It really focused on wealthy countries that have been what they called over-reporting the financing that they've provided to help other less wealthy countries deal with climate change. The numbers are huge. The number the discrepancy between what the countries said they would do and what they actually did, according to CARE. And I know that your organization, Prakriti Resources Center, played a role in that report. So can you explain to us the role that the organization played? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, in order to get to this uh, point of the, of the report that, the, that has just come out and then it got quite a lot of uh, international uh, attention, was basically of the fact that there is a huge uh, responsibility of the developed countries in providing uh, climate finance to the developing countries. And one of the basis for that uh, is that, you know, under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change or the Paris Agreement, uh, the donors, or let's say the developed countries have agreed to provide uh, support, financial support to the developing countries. And it's including like that of uh, uh, my own country, Nepal. And for that, uh, they have two uh, major uh, you know, balance that they have to strike. One on the mitigation side, which means reducing the carbon emission, but on the other hand, also helping uh, poorer and uh, uh, communities that have been impacted by the impacts of climate change to adapt to the impacts of climate change. And this particular report is highlighting the financial flow that the countries are actually receiving or what the donors say in terms of what they have provided. Has that been really delivered at the country level? And do the countries who receive that amount really feel that that is the climate finance or the climate adaptation finance that, that it receives. So basically this report is, a, uh, is an effort to see that 
have the donors uh, or the developed countries really made their commitment committed under the United Nations? There were six countries that were uh, chosen as a case story countries. It was three from Asia and three from, uh, from the African countries. And one of the countries from uh, Asia was uh, Nepal. And my organization, Prakriti Resources Center, did the case story here, uh, the study here. Uh, we looked into the OECD database of the uh, climate change adaptation projects coming into the country. At the same time, we chose about uh, 15, 20 projects and dived uh, really deep into to see whether there were, uh, what it meant in terms of climate finance was there or not, and tried to come out with this uh, report. So we have a one case uh, country uh, report. We have a report for Nepal, but at the same time, this is also feeding into a global report. Okay, great. Among those 15 projects that you looked at for your report, again, there's that huge gap, if I'm reading this correctly, Within the 15 projects, the donors said that they were committing $617 million, $617,887,802 to be exact. But the amount that was actually delivered, if I can put it that way, $363,109,020. So 59% of the total. Am I reading that correctly? Yes, that's very uh, much the case that our analysis shows. So what we need to be very uh, aware about the fact is, of course, these are very symbolic because the donors have provided us of hundreds of projects since 2013 in the name of uh, climate change. These were only representative uh, uh, projects that we chose. Even these choosing of these uh, you know, 15 projects give us an estimate that there is over-reporting already, almost about 60% of the adaptation finance that the donors claim to be climate adaptation finance is not actually the climate adaptation finance. It's the development aid that has been counted as uh, adaptation finance. So it does show a trend, at least in Nepal, that the donors uh, providing of the resources are overlapped with the usual overseas development assistance that the uh, countries have been providing. And then of course, there are also certain cases like sometimes you see that uh, you know, some projects are entirely not related with climate change, but they still uh, seem to highlight that this, uh, these projects are supporting climate actions in the country. Okay. Well, it seems pretty clear that there is that, that huge gap. Is it going too far to say that, to call this deception? Is that too strong a word to use? Rather than saying that it's a deception, I tend to put it this in a way that we have a huge, huge problem with the accounting of the finances that we get for climate finance, and we get it as a ODA or the development finance. Because of course, the climate change is a, is a new field that we are looking into. And there's a lot of effort to, uh, to work out how do we account climate finance. And also I, I do understand there are also complexities with the uh, adaptation projects because they very much overlap with the development needs of the country like mine. Because on, on the ground, if you see there are disasters taking place, climate-induced disasters like flooding and, and uh, landslides and drought taking place. But at the same time, there are also communities, you know, even in a normal context where they have not met their, uh, let's say, irrigation needs or you know, addressing poverty through agricultural activities or livelihoods, and then addressing their uh, education, health needs. So when you see this uh, with, with the communities that they already have certain problems with developing needs uh, on the ground. And then when uh, climate change exacerbates its impact on the same communities, so there is a huge overlap. So until and unless we are very much clear about how do you report on what do we call climate actions or what do we call a development need, unless we say that, of course, the, the accounting of these uh, two uh, climate adaptation financing and, uh, and uh, development financing will be complicated. But having said that, the effort needs to be Put into so that we see that there is a, di a differentiation in what we are supporting as climate finance because it's an obligation under the United Nations to for the developed countries to meet their commitments. Whereas in development assistance, it's about you know, humanitarian aid or supporting communities to uh, uh, address their poverty and human rights issues. So I think these two things need to uh, go hand in hand. But at the same time, I would also say that uh, the donors or the developed countries have gradually realized that you know they are under uh, supporting on the adaptation side because it's heavily skewed towards uh, climate change mitigation actions. And that has been realized. And even when this report came out, many of the donors, uh, they came uh, to care our, uh, and they said like, you have done all these studies, which is fantastic. Can you help us you know, identify or account this better? So that's a good sign, I would say. Yes, that does sound positive, actually. 
And I, w I wanted to also to, just to note that you used the ODA, the term ODA a couple of times. It's Overseas Development Assistance, right? Just so we're clear on that. I wanted to ask you about something that is noted in your report, but I, I didn't see it in any of the media uh, articles that I, that I read. The idea of climate financing also being targeted to certain groups in society that may be more affected than others. So uh, we're talking about women uh, providing financing with a gender or through a gender lens, and also marginalized groups that somehow are marginalized for various reasons. It could be economic, or it could be geographic, or it could be uh, in Nepal caste reasons. Your report touched on those issues as well. Can you say something about that? Yes, one of the aspects we also wanted to see was on the gender part, and also on the, you know, if actually it, it's addressing the poverty uh, angle. And because for us, when we see this addressing climate change, it is just not about being an environment issue, but this has very much to touch with the livelihoods and economic and social impact of, the, uh, of this issue. Because whenever a disaster, climate change disaster hits, people are uh, suffering, like, you know, from the economic activities, uh, they have been... Um, paralyzed or they're not able to do their uh, agriculture or they're not able to send the children to schools because of floodings and things like that. So there are a lot of uh, economic and social uh, part associated with this. And climate change problem in a country like ours is not just going to hit the rich people. I mean, they have the more adaptive capacity compared to that of the uh, vulnerable or poor communities. So even donors, when they say that, you know, they're giving uh, the resources, a support for a country like Nepal, they say that it has to embrace the component of gender and poverty eradication. And I think that's very much uh, well accepted. But when we uh, go into the details of this, what you realize is, you know, when donors themselves say that certain project is uh, going to climate change uh, mitigation or adaptation, they also mark, that's what they call it, your marking, which means that you either you have no uh, impact on uh, climate or uh, minimal uh, impact or in high impact. The similar marking is also done for the gender and poverty. And what we realize is they do have marking in there, but when actually coming and assessing the project, the angle is completely missing out there. And to a certain level, poverty addressing those uh, going to those communities may help, but the gender part was not much considered. And we found it quite, uh, quite surprising because uh, for a country like ours, of course, we need to, we need to have that as a, as a major uh, aspect. But at the same time that the resources are reaching to the most vulnerable and uh, most poor or, or ones who are really at, who are having the impacts of the climate change. And that part seems to be a little overlooked uh, and, uh, and then not given much uh, consideration. Okay. I know a little bit about project management secondhand, you know, through people who, who work in it. And I know that donors can be very tough on project managers ensuring that they deliver what they say they're going to deliver. And when I looked at your report, I was quite startled at how blatantly the donors hadn't seemed to live up to the expectations of good project management in some cases, as you were just describing. How would you explain that they failed to meet those fairly basic project management requirements? While we looked into these uh, uh, projects, what we realized donors were just marking to show that they were also sensitive towards those elements, but not uh, essentially very serious when it came to execution. So when we see that in the original report where they mark the, uh, uh, the gender or the poverty, they have done that. And they say that this is, in, this is going to gender or this is gender sensitive uh, projects and things like that. But actually it's not happening on the ground. And for us, it is very key that these uh, projects address the poor uh, communities or gender issues or diamond, gender dimension to ensure that resources are actually going on the ground. You know, the most vulnerable people or those impacted by the issues of uh, climate induced disasters or climate related hazards, they need to benefit out of the support that is coming from internal so that the rich people or the resource capture is not done somewhere in between. I think it's very key that even for donors to account well or monitor well that what they have said or what they have marked in their uh, reports are actually executed on the ground. And there's many ways that that can be done. I know that there, there's reporting and uh, monitoring going on with all the projects, but I mean, it's very interesting what's happening on the ground and what they have marked. We found quite a big uh, discrepancy in that. I've seen numerous leaders from Nepal addressing international gatherings that have some uh, dimension of, of climate change. 
And they often use what I would call this moral argument that the so-called developed world should be helping countries like Nepal because, of course, they produced much more of the emissions. And Nepal is a small country, produced very little emissions, yet it's being impacted extremely heavily by climate change. To you, is that an effective message? Or would there be a, a better way or something additionally that Nepal could be doing to kind of pressure developed countries to be actually living up to their commitments? Well, I think there are two ways how you look into this. One, of course, you, uh, you use the moral ground that uh, we are being impacted by the uh, climate change uh, that's happening globally. And Nepal, whether we you know, cause the problem or not, we have not been um, spared from these uh, impacts. And we already have very detailed information on that. For instance, even 2020, early 2020, there was a report that came out from uh, UNDP and ECMOD, where they said almost 25 glacier lakes in the Himalayas are at the verge of outbursting. And that's a lot of lakes. It's just one uh, in the glacier lakes in the Himalayas, if it outbursts, it's going to have a huge impact down the stream. It's going to take away our bridges or roads, communities, agricultural lands, if there's hydropowers, and then there's going to be a huge use loss. So from that perspective, if you see, the problem that we have not caused is going to create a huge burden on us. And then even last, I mean, uh, uh, two years back, there was a huge flood, uh, sorry, landslide in, 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 uh, in adjacent district. And government has to come and intervene and support that. It means that it's taking away a lot of its... Uh, budgetary resources that could have gone to health, education, and other facilities to address those problems. So in that front, I think it's very genuine to say that Nepal as a non-carbon emitting country or with no historical responsibility, it is bearing the burden. Uh, so it is imperative that the developed countries have to support actions on, in a country like ours. In fact, this is just not a ask, but it's been, it's been recognized as a right because developed countries themselves have said you know, they have committed under the UN to say that they will support country like ours financially, technologically, and with capacity building. And they have a very clear paragraphs and then articles to see how they're going to support. Not just that. They have not just said we will support financially. They have even said, you know, with the numbers, the developed countries collectively came together and said, we will support $100 billion per year by 2020 up to 2025 every year and to support country like ours. It's a number that has come. So we, what we're asking now is to see that whether that $100 billion is, is being actually met or not. Whether recipients, have, do they say they have received or not? Or the providers, do they say they have provided? Because this is with the realization that developed countries acknowledge that it was their historical uh, you know, issue that, that it, the problem caused, and now they are supposed to support, and which, which is a moral obligation. So not just a moral obligation, now it's becoming a, I know, even legal obligation. That's one side of it. But the other side is that, of course, as a country like ours, as I said, whether we get international support or not, we'll have to get into the action. So I think for us to do is also a motivational part that we take part into low carbon development pathways. It means that we also help reduce carbon emission, which is again, the responsibility of the high emitting countries. But then even a country like ours, we have a very, very low uh, carbon emission um, percentage given our uh, global context. But even Nepal is taking now having plans to uh, reduce uh, carbon emission either by importing uh, less uh, fossil fuel or trying to address air pollution through you know, uh, bringing in policies that uh, promote public vehicles or electric vehicles and you know, having um, solar powers, going into renewable energy promotions and things like that. Nepal is uh, trying to protect 45% of its land cover with forest. I think this is a huge action we are taking, which means that we're trying to be a partner in the global effort to address this problem. So I think the both side of as a moral ground and the kind of encouragement with our own actions, they, all, they both need to go hand in hand. Now, earlier you said something that was quite positive, how some countries reacted when the CARE report was released and came to CARE and said, look, we, we want more information about this and, and maybe some assistance in improving the way that we account for what we're doing in terms of climate financing. But the cynical side of me can't help thinking that it's easy for developed countries to make these pledges and to come close to meeting them when times are good. 
but it's also too easy for them to just shirk on these pledges. So for example, that $100 billion figure you, you talked about, from my reading, the countries haven't come close to providing uh, $100 billion per year. And this was the year when they were supposed to have reached that that target. Uh, in fact, I think it's below $50 billion. So I can't help but thinking, what good are these pledges? You, you said that they are they're moral, and at the same time, they're also becoming legally recognized, yet there doesn't seem to be a mechanism for holding the countries to account. I mean, do we only have that kind of moral suasion? Is that the only way to try to pressure developed countries to do what they said they do and to do what people, most people would feel is the right thing to do? Exactly. One of the uh, major objective of this uh, report was also to demonstrate that very fact that what donors have placed, what donors have committed internationally, they have not met in, uh, in practice. So that's why this report was to, uh, as, a, as a pressurizing tool to show that in a country like ours, what, the, what donors promised have not been met. You know, you can see over-reporting, you can see it's being, um, you know, uh, overlapped with the ODA assistance, or the uh, development assistance that's coming so that, you know, the more ODA money is thrown into climate finance, then you have to deliver less climate finance. So the Oxfam also came out with a, with a report. Oxfam estimates that only 22 billion US dollar was actually a climate finance uh, money, but this were all you know, double counted as uh, ODM. So there is a huge discrepancy between what they say they're going to provide, but at the same time, what is being delivered on the ground. So of course, there has to be a continuous process to improve the accounting because under the Paris Agreement, it is the obligation of the developed countries to always say that be two years beforehand to say that this is how much they are going to provide. And then again, after two years, they're going to report to the, uh, uh, to the UN to say that this much money we, we provided to the developing countries. There's an obligation that's under the agreement to say that they will do that. But unfortunately, this had not been the case. For instance, US under the Trump was running away from its responsibility to climate change. They provided very, very less uh, uh, climate change money because Trump did not believe on that. The money that they had to provide even for the fund like global fund like Green Climate Fund, US just pulled it away. They did not uh, contribute anything on, on, on climate change. But I think reports like these are basically to show that what is happening on the ground and what is the moral imperative between those that need to provide and those that need to really receive. So I think we need to keep working on this so that the targets are being met. Well, you've got a huge, huge uh, task ahead of you, no doubt, to number one, get the reporting improved, but number two, uh, ensure that the money arrives. Now, later this year in November is a scheduled meeting of the UN Climate Change Convention. The meeting is called COP26. What usually seems to happen in many of these meetings is that if you're at least watching from outside and reading the media, you'll see that negotiations go on for a week or whatever, and then everything goes down to the last minute. Uh, and, you know, the final two days, no one's sleeping, and there are all of these meetings going on officially, unofficially, in the room, outside of the room. And then suddenly, miraculously, it always seems to happen that at the last minute, suddenly a deal is struck and everyone is happy and the deal is announced. But after reading this, your report and the CARE report, again, the cynical side of me wonders, Will it make any difference if we go to COP26 and again kind of engage in this process of negotiation, come up with another last minute deal, and the developed countries don't, for whatever reason, adhere to these targets? Is there some indication that this year will be, will have a better outcome than previous meetings? Yes, well, uh, on this part, what I would say is I've been following this uh, climate negotiation for quite a number of years now, and I've attended many of these meetings, including the Paris Agreement uh, that happened in, in Paris in 2015. Uh, we do see that a lot of the agreements are being put until the very end. And there are two sides of it. One, for the first week and the first half of the second week, is basically a technical uh, negotiation. So the technical people are coming in and they're trying to negotiate each other and they're trying to thrash out many of the issues as far as possible. 
And, the, and, and then towards the end, what happens is, is the ministers who arrive, and then it's, now it goes to a political level to decide things on that. So if the technical people cannot solve certain issues, then it definitely goes to the political level to decide on that. And that's where the compromises or heavy compromises are made. But what has been realized is not always these uh, uh, negotiations or the compromises have led to the uh, to optimum outcome. Because even while doing the Paris Agreement, one of the things I very vividly remember is it was basically to incorporate or let's say to bring in US on board of this agreement so that they could uh, be a partner in implementing or taking actions on climate change. Because we had a very bitter experience of US moving out of the Kyoto Protocol in 1997 and which they agreed, but then later on uh, the Bush administration didn't agree and they left us. But now having said that, UN is the only ultimate forum where a country like mine, Nepal, or Bangladesh, our neighbor, or even like Vanuatu or you know, Tuvalu or Samoa in the Pacific Island from Barbados in the, in the Caribbean to uh, the United States and Canada or the European Union sitting together and talk to each other about the problems that the global problem that they want to solve. Where would you find other than this inclusive multilateral uh, platform other than talking about this uh, problem? For me, from that sense, it is a right forum where all the countries, 197 members of the UNFCCC can come together and talk to each other and try to find some uh, compromises to deal with this problem. So in that case, yes, it is a good forum. But at the same time, it's also been very frustrating that the outcomes have been very, very slow, uh, not up to the mark to address the problem. Because even now, after the Paris Agreement, the 197 countries agreed that they would all provide a document called NDC, Nationally Determined Contribution. It means a, a national action plan talking about what uh, climate action they would take at their own level. And then submit that document to the UNFCCC. And UNFCCC Secretariat would assess those documents and come out with, to say that how much action is needed to put the world's uh, average temperature to below 1.5 degree or even uh, like below two degree by the end of this century. And the, the Paris Agreement very clearly says that we need to reach 1.5 degrees or max 2 degrees by the end of this century. But what happened was the national uh, action plans put together would put the world into 3.5 degree pathways, which means that is way beyond what is our mark. So now where would we all go and say that this is not sufficient? I think UN is the only firm. So even the one that is coming in COP26, the expectation is that now we are in the world, and we're moving to the world of uh, 3.5 degrees, uh, which, is, which is going to be a very bad scenario if, if we are not uh, taking serious climate action. In order to, uh, to bridge that gap, this is the forum, COP26 will be the forum to look into that, one thing. The second thing is, as we discussed on the climate finance, whether the developed countries have actually provided the money that they said they would want to provide. And if not, then what would the providers or the, what would the recipients say and have a dialogue between each other is the forum on COP26 that they would say. Not just that, in order to account, you know, how to uh, account whether it's adaptation actions or mitigation actions or any uh, other uh, support systems that they have put in forward to evaluate, to have questions, to discuss and COP26 is the forum. So if you look at all this from perspective for my country to go and have a say in the, in the forum and other countries to come together, your COP26 would be the forum. And in that sense, I would support very much, but I would also very much agree with you that the process are very painful, uh, it's lengthy, and sometimes it is not, the outcomes are just not uh, uh, sufficient given the time, resources, money we spend in organizing these events. If you're advising the government of Nepal, and I know you do, your organization does work with the government, about their approach when they go to COP26, would you tell them their messaging should be split on adaptation and mitigation? Or would you tell them, no, it's more important to focus on one or the other? At this point in time, what do you think you would be advising them? For us, as a Nepal, as a country that is uh, as recognized as a least developed countries, we have a lot to do with uh, in terms of meeting our basic needs, in terms of education, health, infrastructure, and other development needs. And the kind of climate impacts that we are facing, it means that, you know, just this year, this Nepali fiscal year, Nepal lost 357 lives just to flooding and uh, landslides. 101 people are still missing because of flooding and, and landslides and heavy rainfall. So it means that this is a 
huge, huge burden on, in our country. That's just a loss of human lives. There's millions of dollars of property being lost. Many people have become landless because they can no longer live in their own area. It's taken away by the floods or the landslides. You know, they have all become internally displaced people. So you see that the impacts that is happening, you see the kind of uh, the uh, government has to take the responsibility of pulling people out of poverty and um, addressing uh, basic needs. In that front, Nepal's priority should be adaptation in the, in the, the global level. And because of this impact, because we need to reflect our reality in the global forums. But having said that, I wouldn't hesitate to say that Nepal would also be a partner in terms of addressing this problem. It means that if there's anything that Nepal can do in terms of taking mitigation actions, Nepal should be ready to do with support coming from internationally, financially, technologically, and in the capacity building field. For instance, if Nepal says it wants to uh, have it 45% of the uh, land coverage with forests, I think that's an excellent idea. It's always uh, good to live in a very green world, right? So in case if, that, if there's a support for that, Nepal should be ready with that. Nepal invests about every year $2 billion U.S. dollars importing fossil fuel, uh, which again, of course, we burn, it goes to the atmosphere, which is causing climate change. If Nepal government says we'd want to replace that fossil fuel with renewable energy, I would say Nepal should be ready to do that with support coming in. You know, I think both strategy has to be taken, but for a status we are in, our priority would be pulling people out of poverty and, and helping uh, you know, uh, adapt to the impacts of climate change. But of course, along with it, also taking uh, mitigation actions in the form of low carbon economic development pathways. Right. And I understand both those points. But do you ever get people who say to you, why should uh, a poor, least developed country like Nepal be spending on mitigation when these wealthy countries that promised X, Y, and Z are only delivering A, B, and C? Like, why should we sacrifice uh, spending on other things as a developing country to spend on mitigation when, you know, these other developed countries who have far more resources aren't living up to their promises? Exactly. So there's no doubt. We need to keep pressuring and then saying that, you know, it is the responsibility of the developed countries to, to reduce the global gr- uh, greenhouse gas emission. And also now, not just the uh, now developed countries, but also a lot of our other uh, uh, high emitting countries like China and India and others who are doing extremely high emission in the current states. But why I also say that we need to be a partner in this effort is basically climate impacts are coming to us already. Just because the waste did a mistake by, you know, burning a lot of fossil fuel and creating climate change, it doesn't mean that we need to go into the same dirty path as a pathway to our sustainable development. So if we, Nepal is to consider a socioeconomic development, taking into consideration environment is, it, is in its own benefit. It's in our own interest to say that we import less fossil fuel and then we invest that money in you know, uh, health facilities or reducing uh, air pollution or you know, factory pollution, building more infrastructure with that money. So I think we need to embrace that. But at the same time, that action would also help uh, address or be a partner with the other, other countries in terms of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emission. But this is in the, based on the condition that the support is coming from international uh, sources so that we can be a partner in that. Of course, we cannot bring our own money, cannot cut down our health resources or, or education money to uh, cut down fossil fuel, I mean, uh, subsidy or things like that. This would be not a good approach for a country like Nepal, because for us, addressing poverty is the and, and should be the priority. And unless governments feel that there, there is a strong obligation to deliver what they said, then the promises uh, are, aren't worth that much. That's very much the case that for us, it's not, not sufficient just for the pledges. And the pledges has to be converted into commitments. The commitment has to be converted into uh, implementation or uh, disbursement of the funds that the countries require. At the end of the day, what matters is not who plays the committed how much. It matters like the poor uh, developing countries like ours that is highly climate vulnerable, how much it gets at the national level and it goes to the ground level. That is the key that we look into. Great. Thank you, Raja. This has been very interesting. On one hand, it seems to be a fairly black and white issue. You know, you promised this, you didn't deliver that. But on the other hand, you helped reveal a lot of the uh, complexities when it comes to to financing. So I really hope that at COP26, both issues are, are dealt with effectively 
we see more money coming after COP26, but we also see that commitment, that political will to, will to ensuring that the pledges are tracked and then the commitments are also tracked and, and the, money, the money is delivered. So thank you very much for helping to clarify some of that. Thank you, Marty. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, uh, letting me share some of my views. And as you said, we do hope that uh, the COP26 that's upcoming, we do hope that also that it actually happens because we missed it last year and the COVID problem goes away and that is being uh, held so that our all these issues can be thrashed out, shared, and that the commitments are uh, turned into you know, implementation and it, it goes into action. And thank you very much.